Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar session, The Art of Coaching. Uh, my name, for those who don't know me, is Katherine Gibbons, and I am the Coach Development and Community Rugby Coordinator here at Rugby Ontario. So before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping pieces um, for those who have not been on one of the webinars yet, as you'll see at the bottom, you'll see a chat icon, a raise hand icon, and a Q&A icon. The chat is disabled. However, the Q&A can act like a chat room. So at any point during the presentation, if you have questions or comments, or if uh, our panelists ask you a question and they need an answer, you can just type it right in the Q&A and Jocelyn and myself and the panelists will be able to see it and be able to answer it. Um, we will ask that you save the raise your hand questions to the end or to post those in the Q&A first, and then we can call on you if you feel like your question maybe wasn't answered fully and you would like to clarify it a little bit more. Um, but with that, Aaron, can you please go to the next slide? I would like to start by acknowledging that Rugby Ontario and our member clubs are situated on traditional Indigenous territories across the province. Rugby Ontario acknowledges that there are 46 treaties and other agreements that cover the territory now called Ontario. Today, I am presenting from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, oh, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, so now I'd like to pass it on over to my colleague Jocelyn, and Aaron, if you just want to hit the next slide so we can introduce our panelists. Awesome. So I'm Jocelyn Poray. I'm the manager of rugby development for Rugby Ontario. And i um, pleased to introduce two of our three panelists. Unfortunately, Dan has had something come up at the last minute and is not able to, to join us after all. Um, but if you had any questions specifically for him, I'm sure um, we'd be happy to pass them on and, and he could get back to you. Um, so we have Mark Spurden joining us, who's the head coach of the Brock University women's team, and Aaron Tackle, who's a phys ed teacher and coach mentor at Collingwood School in BC, and former uh, technical director of rugby for both Rugby Alberta and BC Rugby. Um, so we'll pass it off to Aaron, I'll let you take it away, and uh, yeah, we look forward to learning lots from you both. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, yeah, just a little bit of context. So um, Jocelyn was good enough to, to invite us onto this webinar tonight uh, and pass along some questions, some kind of like pre-webinar questions that uh, maybe we could have a go at answering. Um, I guess the caveat before we start is uh, this is just my perspective of uh, some of the responses. I'm not saying it's the way, I guess it's our way uh, of attacking some of these questions. Um, so I'm just going to present a little bit and then Mark's going to come in on a couple of things. Um, but to start off with, I thought I'd, I would answer uh, the title of the webinar tonight. So uh, the title of the webinar tonight is The Art of Coaching. Um, and I guess it, it would be a good place to start by defining what do we think is uh, good coaching or effective coaching or expert coaching or the art of coaching. Um, so this is a slide from Sports Scotland that have tried to kind of uh, put together or piece together a couple of different sections. So it's my belief there's a couple of different knowledge sections that a, a good coach has. Um, first of all is knowing yourself. So intrapersonal knowledge is about knowing others. So intrapersonal knowledge. Um, and then the knowledge of your subject matter. So pedagogical or professional knowledge. Um, and if you can put those three together, um, you'd be a pretty effective coach. Um, sometimes we think maybe just knowing how to coach is enough. Um, and I'm going to try and take that approach through some of my, my slides, especially around the, the planning side of things. So I think it's, it's important to attack this from multiple different perspectives. So that's why I started with this slide. This is what I think is pretty good coaching. You can find this on the, uh, Sports Scotland website. So the session planning, uh, it's something that I've done a lot of research on recently. Um, I'm going to come at it from quite an academic lens. Um, the references are on the on the slides if you if you want to have a look at them. But ultimately, um, in academia at the moment, I think the first thing that comes to mind for a lot of people when they talk about planning is periodization. 
Um, and some forms of periodization, especially the traditional forms, potentially overlook um, some of the bio, psycho, and social elements uh, and the technical and tacticals. You've almost got these five elements coming together. Um, so this is a slide here, and I've just put a couple of quotes here. Uh, Kahneman and Klein said, the capacity to plan and rationalize through coaching practice is a determining factor of coaching expertise and effectiveness. So it is something you want to do if you want to be an expert and effective coach. It also suggests that as, as humans, for some reason, uh, we tend to do things potentially not the most effective way, which is to do first and think later. And I think if you're going to be a good rugby coach, then planning and, pl and session design is something you certainly should take on board before you start doing. And then I know a lot of us have been on the, uh, the coach education courses, which talk about plan, do, review. So this is really the, the plan part of it before we dive straight in. Uh, and a really good quote there by Abraham Zadal. Um, in essence, planning is, a, and it is our attempt to predict the future. So when the future arrives, we're prepared for it. So we try and plan for as much as we possibly can, potentially not everything. But ultimately, this picture on the screen is, is showing you the three kind of aspects that we should be, be approaching that. And I'll try and break it down a little bit. But who are we coaching is a, is a massive contextual factor. Um, so do we really know the players that we're coaching? Um, how you're going to coach it might be different pedagogical perspectives and approaches. Um, so not really... Um, coaching a way, but perhaps a, a way that's a tailored to your audience. And also, what are you coaching? So um, in there, we've got um, thinking tools coupled with understanding and, and more of the technical, tactical type stuff. So uh, you can find that. There's a really good paper from Till et al. Uh, 2019 that, will, that really digs deeper into those little sections. So for me, uh, I took this and said, OK, well, let's start to practice what I've been preaching. So um, I put together a simple questionnaire for my high school rugby players. Um, and in this paper is by, by Collins et al. It talks about these three different worlds and our players often sit in one of the three, but sometimes they can overlap and they can maybe sit in two of the different three. But what I asked my questions was, which one best represented your approach to rugby? So is it measured against winning at the highest level possible, which is elite reference? Um, is it more about doing your personal best? Or is it really just about taking part, being around your friends, being uh, keeping some status in a in a group or a club uh or is it just about staying in shape and from and you can see the results of my survey on the left there and almost unanimously the players in my high school rugby team is sitting in the participation um element of of that three dimensional figure so um from this perspective uh colin said performance is complex non-linear multi-layered and emergent Developing an in-depth understanding of who is vital for all coaches in undertaking the athletes' needs analysis process. So understanding who your players are and not just how you want to approach them is, for me, probably the starting point for your planning. This slide's going to give you a little bit of an insight. So uh, T et al. in 2018 put together a paper. Um, tactical periodization might be something that you're, you, some of you are unfamiliar with. Some of you might know. It's a concept that actually came from soccer uh, out of Europe. A lot of uh, Spanish and Portuguese teams came up with uh, the concept of tactical periodization. Uh, Eddie Jones famously has uh, been using it with the England team. Whether it works or not, um, I guess we'll see. Um, but this concept is something that I brought into my high school team. So this gives you a snapshot of how I'm approaching a week. Now, we, we talked a little bit before we started live this evening about I'm lucky that I get four touches on the players per week, three training sessions and a match day. Um, I'm well aware that that's not common across the entire country, but you can see how I've started to theme a day. So I have um, some buzz, buzzwords in my coaching approach, hard, fast and finish. Um, I don't necessarily do them in that order, but you can see how I've started to plan for the week. And once I have my weekly plan, then I will slot the content in on top of that um, to keep me in check and making sure that the players are getting a balanced diet of content throughout the week. Um, so you'll notice that we're not going to do three attack sessions throughout the week. Third aspect is the the. Um, the biological aspect. So uh, for me, especially working with children, uh, I'm incredibly aware of where their bodies are at. Um, this is a model, uh, I think a lot of us would have seen, um, gosh, what was it called? Doesn't matter. This, this is kind of an updated version um, of the youth development model. 
Um, Long-term athlete development model was the one that we were using a lot of people are nodding. So uh, you understand that. I think this has kind of been superseded now a youth development model around where our athletes are at biologically so that we can understand that and incorporate that into their training. So I've put out that red line on there to show where the athletes that I work with, where are they in their developmental stage, um, both chronologically and uh, growth maturation wise. Um, so again, a really, really important factor in your planning. And then I understand, I, I'm very aware that there's an awful lot of, uh, of writing on here. Perhaps you can take a snapshot of it and go back and look at it in the future. But um, this is a concept of nested planning. So this would be, uh, I've gone from kind of micro, uh, macro, this would be my meso cycling. So this is a, a four year plan uh, for a high school rugby team that takes into effect uh, both the biopsycho and social aspects that I think uh, take to become quality rugby players and a good rugby program. Um, so that's the process that I'm going through and the academia that I'm basing um, some of those decisions on uh, around planning and decision-making for high school rugby players. Ultimately, I would use this for, for more competitive rugby players as well. I would just um, take into account the who, the what, and the how, uh, and, and write the plan accordingly. The next section was a question around uh, preparing and adapting on the fly as a coach. And I think I've got kind of two perspectives on this. So uh, this was a paper by Tilden Jones, and he talked about, um, about chefs and about cooks. Um, so I'll just read through some of this stuff. So it says that high performing chefs have in-depth understanding. And every time I say chef or cook, I want you to replace that word with coach. Um, so maybe we've got expert coaches and novice coaches. And what the paper was trying to explain through an analogy is that expert coaches are like chefs. And the reason that they are chefs is because they have the ability to combine different methods to produce uh, far more enticing uh, products. Um, they're able to make adjustments because they have an understanding of the products that they're using. Um, and they're able to create the desired outcome and often use it uh, with innovation and creativity. And the cook or the uh, amateur coach or the less experienced coach uh, follows a, a recipe. So for that might be following what other coaches do, um, not really having that in-depth understanding. And ultimately, they're just looking to recreate rather than innovate. Um, so therefore adapting, if, if you are still in the stages of being a, an amateur or a less experienced coach, a lot of the time you focus on recreating rather than uh, innovating. Um, and it's not to say that both are not good uh, at their job, um, but if we want to be good at adapting, I think we need to be, become more of an expert, which means we need to understand different methods. We need to have an in-depth understanding of the content so that we can recreate it on the field rather than copying other coaches. So taking that perspective in mind, um, what I've done is thought through what I think is quality content. And so I've created a bank of um, drills, for example, or block practice, however you refer to it, so that I've got that understanding so that I can refer to it often and I can go back to it and I can do it so much that I've become uh, what I'd like to be as an expert. So play to space for me is attack. And these would be some of the drills that I would use consistently so that I've got an understanding of what's going on here so I can coach it well. Um, and I've broken attack down into all the different ingredients that I take that I think will make a good attack. So I think an attack, you need the ability to pass different ways. And you can see in this drill, the players aren't just doing perfect passes. It's over the top. It's, um, you know, just reacting to the situation there. So we've got different types of passes off both hands, I think is a, is a fundamental attack skill. We've got catch skills. So in this example, the player in the middle is trying to intercept the pass between the two red bibs or pennies, and they're focusing on catch skills. So now that uh, these players understand the concept of the drill, I can then coach better within that. Got some other catching skills or different variation of catching skills in the game. Uh, this is uh, evasive running uh, and ball carry. So uh, this is a, a two-person race between the 22s. So the defender, you can see in green, if they get a touch, it turns into a flat-out sprint. And the yellow penny is trying to go 22 to 22 without getting touched. 
And then we've got close contact evasive uh, ball carrying skills or evasive running skills. So these are all of the ingredients that I'm using to try and come up with this recipe. Uh, and then towards the end of this video, I've got the different types of kick that I would maybe use to build in a good attack. Finally, support and second touches. So I've, this one is a simple 2v1v1 drill, uh, understanding the player that passes the ball, where are they gonna go next to get a second touch or support the ball carrier. So that might be my recipe book. So now I'm trying to understand all of this content, use it often, become an expert so that I can adapt. So if I need content, if I need, if somebody, if one of my co-coaches says, hey, can you do a, a passing drill or a catching drill? I'm on it straight away and I can adapt to that situation rather than having to freeze in that moment. Another way of doing it, uh, some of you may have come across this acronym, change it. Um, so this is more of a, a game scenario. So if you're working within small sided games or even large sided games, uh, this is something that isn't uncommon um, in a lot of coaching uh, manuals now. So change it, you can see there, uh, each of the letters stand for something that you would change within uh, the game. So the H stands for how to score. So you might change the point scoring system. And that's how you maybe adapt your coaching or um, use constraints based coaching to constrain the game to make sure that you can adapt on the fly. So now you're only thinking about a couple of things rather than really going into depth and detail. Okay. Uh, third question that came in uh, before the webinar was around creativity and games-based coaching. So how, how do you introduce or how do you maintain creativity through your sessions and how do you use games? So here's, how, here's my approach. Um, I have this acronym TLC, so um, teaching, learning, and competition. So for me, in a drill environment um, or an enclosed environment, I think there's a lot of teaching going on. There's a lot of one-to-one. -one, there's maybe some technical feedback. Um, the learning happens in a small-sided game because we all know that uh, when we do things like whole part whole, then the whole might be the learning, but the part is maybe the teaching and the drills, and then it comes back together. But we need the learning to understand whether the teaching was effective. Um, so that's where, for me, small-sided games and video game design comes in. Uh, and then finally, the competition. So for me, that's maybe at the other end of the spectrum where the coach will remove themselves a little bit more and we do some scenario-based. Uh, this team has this many points, this team has this many points, um, and there's this much time left on the clock to try to win the game. Um, and I've also got a slide there of some of the golden rules that I think take to, to, uh, to manage some really great adaptive game. So just setting the scene here of how I see the different components of our coaching um, and where I think this question is landing in the learning section. So here's how we'll do it. And I've created games. Um, some of you may have read a really great book called by Doug Lamov called The Coach's Guide to Teaching. And essentially what Lamov was promoting is that, uh, a concept of name your game. So, um, if you play a game with your team, if you name it, they'll ultimately remember uh, the rules of the game, the structure of the game, maybe the tactical or, or technical skills that are involved in that game. So when you revisit that game again, they're starting not from scratch, but on the base that they built from the last time they played it. So I uh, went with naming all the small sided games that I play after countries, uh, countries that I think play that way. Um, unfortunately, I, I found a really great clip but it didn't relate, but this is New Zealand. So every time I play with my players and I say, we're gonna play New Zealand, they straight away, they know that one team of the All Blacks, the other team are whoever they want to be. Uh, the team that whoever they want to be get as many phases as they want to score. Um, but the All Blacks, once they get a turnover, they get one phase to score the other way. Um, so for me, when I'm a defense coach, I'm using this game to promote keeping the ball alive, um, making the biggest impact on that first 20 seconds after a turnover. Um, so this is a clip from France, Australia about two weeks ago now, and it really brings this game to life around once you get the ball back, what are you going to do within the next 10 to 20 seconds um, to, to turn those pressure, pressure into points uh, and score almost like that, the intercept mentality in NFL football. So here we've got France to carry the ball hard and then a kick over the top. So in this case, Australia and New Zealand, they've got the ball back. Now they've now got one face to score. So they keep the ball alive. They get people behind the ball. They're creative. They're confident to play from deep.
So for me, the small side of game New Zealand is right trying to recreate this moment within the game. And I think ultimately that's what I'd like my message to be is can you create small sided games and use games to recreate moments of the larger sided game? So I've taken this concept and expanded it. I think I'm up to about 16 games now. So this slide will give you an idea of, of some of the other ones uh, that I've borrowed and, and taken from other people and created myself. So I'll give you an overview. Uh, Samoa is a high contact game. It's a contact prep game. It's, it's something that I might use in uh, a pregame warmup, but ultimately it's trying to get players that might be catching the ball and have the threat of a defender on them straight away. Um, as we all know, if you catch the ball above your head against Samoa, it's not a good thing. So you want to lower your center of gravity, et cetera, et cetera. South Africa is a kicking game. Um, Wales is a shooting defender game. If you remember back to the 2019 World Cup, Wales are pretty famous about having a, a scrum half flying out of the line. So in that one, you would have one rushing defender. And if they make a touch, you get the ball back. Fiji is a choke tackle or a hold up tackle type game. So if you get the ball, if you can hold up the tackle for more than uh, three seconds, you get the ball back. Uh, and Japan is a double touch game. So um, if a player is touched in possession of the ball, they can continue to run but not score, um, which is a fairly chaotic game. Lots of running, lots of long distance, high speed running, which we like to see when we, we watch the Japanese. And I will note that this is um, based off the male version of these international teams. My apologies, but that was my perspective going into this. Okay, and I think getting close to uh, the content that I'm delivering. So making the most of your coaching resources or co-coaching, and I know Smurdy is gonna talk about this a little bit too, but this is a great slide that I've used uh, when I'm uh, co-coaching um, with a group of coaches and it's a, it's a co-coaching review. Um, so this one might be something where if I'm coaching with three other coaches and we come back into the office after a training session, uh, this is what we're talking about. So uh, time and task, clarity message, but the right-hand column I think is something that potentially we don't do all that well. Um, so for me, it's did all the coaches participate in add value? Um, and I can tell you, I've been around um, national team sessions in Canada where there's five coaches, but only one is coaching and four resting, chatting, having coffee, um, planning what they're going to do with the rest of the day, when really we should all be adding value. Even if you are a positional coach, we're all rugby coaches. So did, did everybody add value? And I think that's making the most of the resources you have. Uh, did you see it from different perspectives or lenses? And if, if so, what did you plan for and what did you see? And then asking the question, how could we have coached as a pack better? Um, I think if we do that, we will make far more use of the resources that we have. Okay, I'm going to pause. That was a lot of talking. Um, Justin, shall I hand it back to you? Yeah, sure. We'll see if we have any questions or, Smyrny, if there's anything you want to jump in there, comments just on Aaron's stuff there. Yeah, I was just going to sort of jump in on the uh, the coaching with teams. I think people think that the more coaches you have, you're in kind of a, a luxury position. But um, it's also where probably arguably more planning is needed ahead of time so that all coaches are on the same page. Um, too many voices at one particular part of your training session might be detrimental to the athletes and confusing to the athletes. So um, I know in the past when I've been on many coaching teams, um, we have kind of a rule that, you know, your lead coach for that part of the session is the one that does the debrief and talks and answers questions or asks questions. Um, the other coaches, if they see something, just kind of get in the ear of that coach to let them know what they saw so that that one person can deliver. And then you don't have that confusion, too many voices, conflicts, that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's you know, again, um, how to stay out of that, uh, that trap of uh, everyone has, has a say kind of thing. Um, I think also, you know, preseason, your coaches, your team of coaches will have various roles. You might have an attack coach, defense coach, um, forwards, backs, scrum, line out. If you're in a real luxury situation, you might have a kicking coach, technical coach, those kind of things, right? So, 
Um, everyone has their area of expertise. And um, then if the athletes kind of know that, they also know who to go to on or off the field uh, for questions and that kind of thing, right? Um, then I guess if you're the, the lone wolf coach, um, how do, you, how do you do everything yourself? So I guess the questions you're asking yourself then are, um, how would you manage a debrief with uh, your backs, your forwards, your everybody together, um, or two teams who are playing against each other? One team might be playing on attack, one team's playing defense. How do you manage that? Um, do you do that all yourself and do one at a time? And then, or do you have a leadership, um, you know, where they're debriefing and you're just kind of, trying to listen in on each group now and again. Um, so giving giving that leadership opportunity to athletes. Uh, if you're in a situation where you can, if you've got, uh, you know, you got grade nines and you're all, they're all new to it, that might not happen, but uh, then, you know, what are you doing differently then? Uh, the lone coach, how are you managing stations of activities? Are you doing stations because you're the lone coach? Um, and, and or groups. Um, are you managing the different groups? Do you have the leaders to be able to do that? So um, I'll kind of leave it there for it looks like there's a question or a comment in the Q&A. Um, let's go back and see if there are any comments on what's been said so far. As Aaron said, there's been a lot of information there so far. So let's see what uh, see what the audience or participants want there from us. So Aaron looks like you were kind of taking a stab at this here. Um, question kind of more specifically to you, maybe on how you might have adjusted if coaching a woman's side. Um, from a concept perspective, I don't think a lot. Um, I might reevaluate some of the, the names of the games, but I think ultimately the game is the same and you're trying to recreate a lot of the same pictures. Um, there are some things that happen in the men's game that potentially happen less in the women's game. For example, uh, I think there's far more kicking in the men's game than there is in the women's game. I can't back that up with stats. It's just my my perspective, having watched a lot of uh, men's and women's rugby recently. Um, so perhaps then I want to create more of the pictures that I'm seeing within my context. So maybe I'm not playing as many of the kicking games, or maybe I do. Maybe I want to be the one team that's different. Um, I think some of the better nations that finished in the in the Women's World Cup had a stronger kicking game. Um, and maybe that's something that they're they're recreating more in their uh, training environment. So I don't think I would change the concept too much. I would just see what context that I wanted. And sure, if I wanted, maybe uh, my kicking games are now based around England rather than um, somebody else in the men's side, South Africa, for example. Um, I hope that answers the question. But ultimately, the the the. The concept is to take moments of the game and try and, and recreate it within the training environment by constraining and having a games-based approach. I can speak a little to that too, sort of going from being a, a boys or men's coach to a women's and girls coach. So um, right now coaching at the Ontario junior level with uh, girls and the, obviously uh, Brock senior or Brock's women's team. Um, you talk about sort of attacking through, attacking around and attacking over into the space behind, which is your, your kicking game. So if you're not really kicking and attacking that space behind, you're, you've got basically a two-pronged attack. So um, I know the women and the girls love the opportunity to try the kicking game. And as Aaron said, you just uh, create a lot of modified games where they can kick and find the green space. And um, we've used the various point systems uh, that will, for scoring, that will change the pictures that the defense will show you so that they can either attack with a kick or attack through or attack around the outside. Um, and uh, it doesn't, you know, the coach doesn't have to do anything and say, okay, defense play tighter, defense put uh, three back in the backfields. You just, uh, if you want to encourage kicking, you might say you get uh, 10 points for attacking through the middle, uh, one point for attacking out wide, one point for uh, attacking over. So you let the defense talk about how they're going to defend 
and they decide, well, we're not going to let them through the middle, so we're going to be really tight and only allow the around and over. So um, you're kind of looking for those outcomes. And if you want just the over, you might give five points for attacking around the outside. So they're bringing everyone up in the line and very few back so that now there's green space to attack. So um, just being creative with the games you use. Um, and then uh, obviously then your breakouts and your skill drill part would be, okay, so how do we execute the kick um, you know, better and to find those green spaces. Okay, thanks for that, both of you. I like that, the idea of uh, points based on what you want the defense to do in terms of what you want the attack. I haven't really heard it uh, with that perspective before. Um, a comment here that kicking sessions um, should also include counterattack strategy. Um, not so much question. I don't know if either of you want to touch on that, but we've got a few other questions here as well. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Um, and which is why I've named my tech play to space. Um, so I, I simply ask a question, where's the best space? A lot of people, um, we've all heard a coach tell us um, two passes away and some things like that in, in counterattack. Uh, it may well be that the person that receives a second pass gets absolutely flattened. So maybe it wasn't the best strategy. So I think it's around um, clues and cues and, and, and questioning players. But yes, a, a strategy is useful. Um, but I would be coaching that through questions once we get the ball back is um, how do we play to the best space and how do we keep the ball alive? Do you want me I to think, uh, I can Sorry. sort of respond to that a little bit too. Um, I've used kicking games with just touch variations, uh, which allow the kick. So, you know, a touch, you would go to ground like normal. Um, whether you do one over and then the next person spin, a defender would drop, get back in the game. On any kick, the person that fields the kick doesn't take the first touch. If they get, they don't go to ground on the first touch. They have to keep playing. If they get touched twice, um, the ball's turned over. So what that does is it makes them look for uh, a kick counter or a support player to pass to. So the support players are now getting back more. They're looking for space to kick to so they don't get touched twice. Um, the team that kicks is looking to now have a good kick chase as well so that they can get the double touch and turn the ball over. Um, much like in a real game, if there was a tackle made and the second player's there, they're there to poach the ball. So. Um, so games like that, again, um, you're just looking for or you're asking the players, what outcomes are we looking for? Why have I put that uh, stipulation into the game or that rule into the game? And they come up with that kick chase piece or the support piece. So um, uh, and it's not structured. It's not if this happens, we'll do this. It's it's chaos. It's great. And they start figuring things out on their own with that. And you can have some good uh good conversations and debriefs with that. Yeah, um, a few more great questions coming in here. So I'll try and keep us along the same path a little bit while we are, what we've already talked about. Um, so David says, I like the idea of naming games so the players remember them, but if you progress over the season and add additional rules or make the games more complex, change the rules as mentioned, to emphasize different skills, do you keep the same name or change the name at some point? So where does that flow go, I suppose? Uh, yes, no. Um, if you want to, uh, I, I think what and what I've found is these games that I've shared with people have always gone away and made them better um, and then adapted them to what they need um, and made changes. And that's cool. Um, I guess you've got to, again, what's your context? Do we need, do you need to change the name? If not, um, I'll give you an example. As soon as somebody says, let's play Japan uh, at my school, it doesn't matter whether it's grade eight or grade 12, they all know the rules. Um, and then there can be different variations within that, but they understand the basic concept of that game. Um, and it's just, that's just the name that it, that's, is what it is now. It's not double touch, it's Japan. Um, I guess you've got a question, is it gonna help? And if the answer is yes, then do it. Yeah. When it comes down to right um any advice on how you would adapt if you coach youth from moving from club through rep level for instance do you use the same drills and games 
but just make them more challenging or do you have different ones? This is kind of playing on what you just answered, I think there. Yeah, I would keep the same um, and I would just coach them differently. So I would add either group challenge in there or I would challenge a different player to do it a slightly different way. Um, so you just change, you're moving, moving some parts all the way. But again, having a base foundation is going to allow you to really adapt on the fly. And I guess that was the question is, if you've got something to go to, then you can always build off of it and regress from it. But now you've got that kind of starting point, which I think a lot of time I've noticed with coaches, um, we need to work on this. And then you start to rack your brain over the years of coaching that you've had. What did I do to, to combat that last time? But if you have kind of this catalog that you just stay with and it's simple uh, and it's based on principles that you think uh, work well, then I, I think you go, can't go far wrong. Um, you'll often notice that some players come through with you. So if you go from a club to a rep level, you might have a player that's played that game and there'd be really great coaches within that game for everybody else because they know the, and, and so this is what the Lamov book talks about is cognitively we have like this working capacity in our brains. Uh, I apologize to all the psychologists on here that I'm going to butcher this, but this is my understanding of it. When we play a new game, and it's often why as coaches our drills fail the first time we ever do them, is that our brains are trying to understand what are the rules and the boundaries of, of the drill of the game. And once I understand the rules and boundaries, then I can start focusing on the skill that's probably being applied within that. So if I'm still trying to figure out the rules, my skills are going to be bad. But once I figured out the rules, now I'm at kind of level two of the game and I'm starting to focus on if it's catching and passing, I can now just focus on catching and passing the ball. If my catching and passing becomes autonomous to the stage where I don't have to think about it anymore, I've got some muscle memory, I've done it repetitively lots of times, I start to then take my eyes away from the ball and look at time and space. So now you've progressed to kind of level three of the game. And then once you get time and space, then you get tactical understanding. So um, if you've got players that are already kind of going through those levels, um, it's really great for them to, to revisit them because they're not starting at level one anymore. They might already be at level three and they can really show you what they can do. So I would keep stuff the same. I would just adapt it within the context. Yeah, I mean, how many times as coaches do we hear, wait, what are the rules again? <laughs> um, and as you said, yeah. Or, or, yeah. or you try a drill for the first time and it fails, but you try it the second time and it goes really well. It's because people are figuring out the drill mm -hmm. and now they're able to apply it to the skill. I think that in my mind, that's the concept behind it. Yeah, and I think the more advanced you want to play too, you can play games with a lot more chaos and a lot faster pace um, because they understand positioning and where to go at every breakdown or touch if you're playing a touch game versus a club team or even a junior rep team might be a little slower to that. They don't quite have the pictures on where, where they need to be on attack or defense. So you might want to hold the ball at the breakdown for a three count or a five count, allow them to, you know, uh, cognitively think, where am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to be? What's my role right now? Uh, and then as they get better, you, you, decrease the count and speed the game up and let the chaos uh, evolve again. So. Um, this question probably for both of you in becoming an expert coach, I assume you've had, you've made mistakes or errors as a coach along the way. How did you best learn from your mistakes through people, players, other coaches, bystanders, or through books, videos? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll go first. I'm yeah, quite, go ahead. <laughs> by no means an expert. I'm not an expert. Um, there's a re really good quote um, from Eddie Jones is like, coaching is a game that you never get to the end level. Like you just, you never finish coaching. You don't take everything off and then you just become <laughs> an expert coach. Um, we're always learning. Um, some of the things that I've done, um, a couple of different things, I guess. First, um, there was a, uh, during, COVID, I was on a webinar um, and somebody said the quote that um, novice coaches go to courses, uh, intermediate coaches go to conferences and webinars and expert coaches go for coffee. And I thought that was really cool. 
um, mm -hmm. because you learn the most informally. Uh, I'm, I'm from up here. So uh, I started a, uh, like a, a chat group, a Friday morning chat group. We called it the coffee club because we we're trying to be expert coaches. So we were just drinking coffee and talking about rugby. It's become one of the, the biggest kind of sliding doors moments of, of my coaching um, because the people within that club were I, I've just been able to share and they've been able to bounce back um, and talk about topical stuff. So number one, I think you need a coffee group and you need to talk about your coaching. And I think you need to share and get feedback um, here. I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? Um, which gives you just mentorship from a whole bunch of people rather than just one people, uh, one person. Um, the second thing that I did recently, I did a study on my own coaching. Um, and there's actually questionnaires that you can send to players that will give you some really good self-reflective feedback. And you can also video self-coaching. And there's a, a, a bunch of, of tools to see whether you create uh, kind of an empowering uh, environment or a, a disempowering environment. Um, but yeah, recently the, the feedback that I got from players was probably the most self-reflective stuff. Um, the, the one specifically that I used was called the multidimensional uh, motivational climate observ observation system, which sounds really, really technical, but it just was a Google form that went out to players that they could answer anonym anonymously and tell me a little bit about me, uh, which was nerve wracking to say the least. Um, but it also told me, I think my biggest feedback that came from it is how I treat my perspective best players in comparison to those that don't think they're the best players which is huge feedback. And I think it's something that we all do, but it just kept me on top of it. Um, so that's just a couple of things that I do. And I watch a lot of rugby. Um, so books, videos, pretty much everything. I'm a bit of a rugby nerd. Yeah, I, I mean, it's going to be somewhat repetitive, I guess. But uh, yeah, you never stop learning as a coach, uh, number one. Um, I've got gray hairs and I'm still learning. Um, the coffee group, we didn't call it that, but it's a, it is that you find some uh, fellow coaches that you uh, really work well with and sort of give and receive feedback well from each other. Uh, and that helps tremendously. Um, but also feedback from your athletes is perfect. Uh, I know we do it at the university level. Um, right now we're postseason. We're having one-on-one -on -one interviews or meetings with each and every athlete. And there's some valuable feedback that comes out of that. Um, we also have started this year with more of a, we have leadership groups on, on our team. So it's not just a leadership group, which is kind of controlling everything else. Um, one of our leadership groups are called Captains in Rugby. And their job really is to provide us that feedback. Are we going through the, you know, at the beginning of a session, are we starting to go through the motions? Is it too repetitive what we're doing? Um, do we need change in this area? Or we're not getting enough of this. Um, we need more of that, that kind of stuff. So um, selecting that group of athletes that you know will be, uh, be able to give you that feedback and look at it because you know, yeah, they watch rugby. They understand the game. They see the training sessions. They know that the team's getting too beat up during the week before a game. So we should be doing a little less contact or we need to do more uh, to get that right mentality before a game. So, um, so that we've found uh, very helpful. Uh, we're in early, early stages with that. So um, obviously at the end of the season, postseason, now we're reflecting on how that's worked. And um, do we give them, you know, more autonomy uh, with those roles type thing. But uh yeah, feedback is the common theme here, obviously, where you get it. Um, you can't get it from enough places, I think. Um, I get feedback from our administration who don't know much about rugby, and that's a different type, obviously. That's more of your off-field or your organizational stuff. So, um, uh, Lots of great points there. Um, We've got one. I know, Aaron, you're kind of taking a stab at this. This is a big question, um, and it actually plays into an, another piece that I think maybe Dan was going to tackle a bit more. So we'll ask you guys to, to touch on it here in terms of managing uh, selection, sort of the, the balance between identifying players for selection, but also developing players. Swear, so, do you want to go first? Uh, it's a lot. Yeah, sure. 
Um, again, it depends on what are we selecting for? What are we, um, where's the development piece? So if it's high school, are we making cuts? Are we doing selections or are we really just developing a uh, club? It's a pay to play thing. So arguably that's a really development piece. And what Aaron talked about previously in that sort of um, long-term athlete development, um, which has been changing over time, uh, it's still the same concept and philosophy. Once you get into more rep, like you're trying out for Ontario, you're trying to get into what we just have gone through in uh, Winter Academy for Ontario and or university, now you're looking at, okay, we're looking at fitness tech tests and scores so you probably bring a company in that does that very well we don't stand there with our stopwatch anymore and uh time athletes crossing the line um then we're looking at certain skills and activities so running them through uh catch pass track tackle possibly ball in contacts do we look at scrummaging lifting in line outs and those kind of things kicking for for other athletes um so your basic skills and then we get them in modified games again to see who kind of rises to the top with the decision making or the awareness um those kind of things um or who's the natural athlete that maybe needs some work on that knowledge piece but man they're going to be something given some time so um how you actually do that that's i mean it really again depends do you have a three-day tryout for a university team? Do you have uh, two hours for fitness testing and two hours in the afternoon for skills and games for a, a Team Ontario type thing? So um, that's where you would collaborate with others and how are we best going to find find the athletes for um, for Ontario, for uh, university. Um, so that's a bit of my take on it. Aaron, you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, so I think it's Damien's question here um, about the interpersonal pers perspective, uh, how important fun it is the most important thing. Um, that's not just my perspective. Academia will back that. Uh, I know that Rugby Ontario did a really great webinar with Amanda Vizic, uh, who did work on fun maps. So fun maps was and well, there was a statement. The number one reason why people or children play sports is because it's fun. The number one reason why children stop playing sports because it's no longer fun. But what is fun? And so there's a lot of research there around what is fun for athletes. Um, from that, I think that will, the byproduct of that is your culture. Um, and I think then kind of just to add on the selection piece for that is, um, for me, selection is quite simple because I've done some thinking around it and it's all based around uh, the values of the team. So if, if I value good people, um, then that's going to be my number one selection criteria. And then once I've made selection really clear, the conversations that come from that are a lot more easier and comfortable because I have concrete evidence that, that matches. We said we were going to do this. Um, you didn't do this. And so it becomes far less more um, my personal opinion against um, the player's opinion. So I think the fun culture is is critical. Um, if you get the good culture, selection should be easier. Um, and also people will be more, more willing to take kind of advice and feedback and that kind of thing. So um, I, I would certainly uh, encourage all coaches to go through around um, what's my, if, if I have these two players, what are the values that I'm going to go through level by level? So it might be a good person. It might be their work effort. It might be that they have an X factor skill. It might be cohesion with teammates, whatever your values are that you think, and then go through that um, when you're talking about selection, also giving feedback about selection. That's, I found the least bumpy road. It's never easy giving somebody bad news uh, or good news. I think also just to add to your selection criteria piece, Aaron, um, if the athletes are aware of the selection criteria ahead of time, um, they maybe had an opportunity to look at what boxes do I need to check before I go to this uh, tryout or what have you. Um, and then the conversations, like you said, after the fact are, yeah, did I do this? Did I do this? Did I do this? Um, or as you're the coach, that might be using that as well. So 
I think things are a lot more clear when you do use a, a concrete selection criteria and the athletes understand what they're working towards. Yeah, the feedback piece there is interesting. I don't know if either of you want to expand a bit more on that, maybe how you give feedback or how you use um, assistant coaches as well in terms of feedback for athletes throughout a, a session. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> um, I mean, one of the one of the things we like to do is coach on the fly, so uh, athletes are as active as possible. But a debriefing session every now and again is is huge. So, um, how you debrief, I think, is important. So, not just bringing them in and telling them this is what you weren't doing, this is what I want to see you do. It's just starting to question them. Put them into pairs, groups of three, and ask the question and say, "I want you to have a quick chat." Okay, bring it back. What was? Uh, what did you talk about? What did you talk about? What did you talk about? Etc. And then um, they're the ones sort of providing a lot of the answers uh, in that respect. Um, as far as feedback after a session, that's when sort of one-on-one -on -one conversations can happen, and you can just again ask the question: How did that go for you? What were you like in this respect? Um, when were things challenging for you? Um, I think asking questions like that allow them to really think. Um, telling, I don't think, does much for the athlete. So, but asking those questions to make them really think about themselves and uh, let them answer some questions. Um, so, Aaron, any thoughts on on that? Yeah, a couple. Um... I think the number one thing that I've learned about feedback is um, setting it up in advance so that players know that feedback may or may not be coming. Um, I'm getting better at this, but I always start with, can I give you some feedback? Um, but even before that, I've learned recently, uh, especially dealing with, with um, high school kids. Um, if, I, if you're playing a game and you're running around and I say, um, can you come here a second? Um, 50% of the group automatically think they're in trouble. So I always let them know if I ask you to come out, it's not because you're in trouble, it's because I just want to have a chat. Um, and, there's a, and I will also tell them, it's going to be two minutes, but I'm going to need you to engage with me rather than stare at the game and I talk to the side of your face. Uh, and also, it's actually a really cool thing for you to be missing because now there's potentially uneven numbers or there's bigger gaps. It's actually a pretty cool for the people within the game to now have to manage one less person within the game. So I've learned recently, set the feedback up before I even start. And then once I've pulled a player out is to ask, do you want feedback? And I think if you do it enough, they actually get comfortable enough to say, no, I'm good right now. My, my brain is full. I don't need any more information. I'm really struggling with this. And the response is, okay, cool. Let's pick it up another time and, and actually cut it off. Um, so rather than making it about me, really making it about the player. Um, so that that's, one of the biggest things um, recently at a, at a national team camp with the under 18s, uh, I set the players up on the very first meeting and saying, I understand that all of you want feedback. Um, ultimately, as a coach, I've got probably a thousand moving parts in front of me and I probably don't see everything. So likely if you come to me with feedback, I'm, the first question I'm going to ask you back is, well, how do you think it's going? Or what do you think? Um, you know, if your question is, how is my throwing? I'm likely going to throw it to you before I give it a stab. So if you don't know, then maybe you need to go figure that out before you come for feedback. Because I think a lot of players just want it, but maybe don't really understand uh, the whole process of giving feedback. So that's what I would add, add on to that conversation. Thanks you both for that. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add in terms of the sort of fun culture piece? I think Aaron made great reference and we'll, we'll try and make sure we have the link to that other webinar as well for you guys on fun. Um, also, if you were not a part of them, our very first webinar from this series on minor rugby talks a lot about the sort of fun and culture piece as well as our program building one. Um, so if you weren't part of those, um, make sure you, you check out the recordings for those that will all be up shortly and, and be sent, sent out to you guys. 
I can make a short, uh, a very quick plug actually back to the, the culture piece. So I read a book um, a couple of months ago called The Culture System by J.P. Nurban, I think is the name. Um, why I liked it, it's a super easy read. So it's, it's really simple to go through. And it's almost like a, a guide or a handbook of different stages of building culture. And I think there's a lot of stuff on culture out there. But uh, this book broke it down into kind of uh, how to establish a culture, how to maintain it and, and support it. Uh, and there's some really good applied learnings there. So if it's something you, uh, if you, if you like to read, that's certainly one I would, I would highly suggest. And, and when you buy the book, it actually comes with a couple of resources as well. Awesome. Um, while we go to this other question, Stu, you had, had written in here in the last few minutes, are there any specific slides from Aaron's deck that you'd like to revisit? If you want to provide some more context on that, are you asking your fellow participants uh, maybe clarify what you mean by that? Um, in the meantime, another question here um, says, Aaron, you'd mentioned asking your players for their expectations, uh, i.e. playing for a social experience versus provincial, provincial level players. How do you manage a team, let's say a high school team, that has players with a big range of expectations? So what would you do if your, your um, yeah, grouping question. was not quite so tight? Great question. One, I think we can all think back to a situation where it's probably happened. I think the, the perfect storm is that everybody congregates to one corner of that triangle. Uh, when you've got a, a, a spread, uh, you know that your, your coaching is going to be challenged. I remember starting out as a coach, I, had, I was coaching a women's team, um, and there were three players on the Canadian national team at that time um, with quite a few caps underneath their belt, um, and then players showing up for their very first training session like literally two very polar opposite ends of the spectrum. And so, it, yeah, it challenges our coaching and it happens far more often um, than we would probably think. Um, I don't know, there's no magic bullet to this for sure, but I think it's about creating personal challenge for players. So how do you either, um, two key words are stretch and support. So how do you create a session within that session, stretch the players and he's stretching the most? Um, so can you provide them with challenges? Can you constrain their training session? Um, or how do you support um, potentially the players that have less experience? Or if you're really, really good, how do you do both at the same time? Um, I, a really good friend of mine, um, Russell Earnshaw with the Magic Academy, I think most of us have heard of him by now, has got some really good player challenge cards. So if you can't think of challenges to stretch players, um, you can go to the Magic Academy website, buy these cards, and ultimately find one that you think is right. Uh, I do it quite often when I'm mentoring coaches, is there's some coach challenge cards too, and I'll find one that I think is really going to stress out uh, a coach and likely give them that card and, and see how they react to that. Um, so then you're getting mini individualized challenge within a session. It sounds like a lot of hard work and it's going to go poorly the first time you do it, like everything we do, um, but if you stick with it, I think players then actually get quite excited about the challenge uh, stretch side of it for sure. Um, so that's one way. Um, I don't know, I'll open it up to the rest of the panel. Um, no, I mean, I don't know that I can add to that, to be honest. That was, uh, was quite good. And yeah, the, the challenge cards are fantastic. I've heard of it. I haven't used it, but I'm definitely interested in looking into those kind of things. So um, so it's very positive for sure. Um, as far as the you know coaching when you got the spectrum, um, I think that's the best place for them to learn is through those modified games. And can you modify the game where those inexperienced athletes had to get a touch on the ball or be in a, you know, you put them closer to the middle of the field instead of letting them stay out on the wings where most of your inexperienced players will go. And you say, no, you can't be there. You got to go in the middle. I want to hear your decisions, um, whether they're right or wrong. There is no right or wrong here for, for us. So make decisions, but do it at a hundred miles an hour. And things tend to go well when you do those kind of things. And if they don't, we'll, uh, we'll have a chat and we'll learn from there. So, um, but yeah, in those games, put them in the middle, put the pressure on them. You talked about really challenging people. So that's a, that's a scenario where they will be challenged in the middle of the field because now they are a decision maker. They're going to be touching the ball more often than not. So, um, 
yeah, that's that's kind of my take on that piece. But I'll, I'll give another example of using a resource to try and help kind of mitigate some of this stuff. So I, I built a rugby board game um, that I've, I've used in phys ed classes. Um, and at certain times, players will have to exit the game. Again, you get uneven numbers. Maybe they'll leave one game and join another game. Um, but in that transition, uh, almost like Monopoly, so you move up a board, and if you land on uh, cheat or challenge, uh, you'll turn over a card and, and there it is. Um, and then you can give that card to somebody on your team that you think needs it the most. So if you've got inexperienced players and they need a cheat, then you can tell them, you know, that this rule doesn't apply to you or you can push the boundaries on this rule. And I think if you've got a good environment where people get excited about that, that works really well. If people think it's corny and inauthentic, it's probably going to fail pretty quickly. So again, you might have to take into account whether that works for you, but it's just another way um, of of getting that kind of stuff into the game, it becomes super competitive because everybody wants to move their their little tile to the to the end of the monopoly board, as it were. Awesome. Um, another question here: Do you have any specific coaching role models that have shaped your coaching styles? Or I suppose. What has coached, shaped your coaching style? We can ask maybe. Um, I don't know about particular role models, but I think as a coach, um, you've had your own coaches that you've liked or disliked, or there's certain things uh, within those coaches that you've taken that will fit your personality as a coach. Um, I don't necessarily look to a, a coach at the international level or within our own little coaching society um, and say, I want to be that person. I want to be like them because we're different people. So I think you've got to take things which fit who you are. And that goes back to one of Aaron's slides, you know, knowing who you are. Uh, but, uh, and when you do coach with a team, you know, if you get um, the luxury of choosing your team or going to join a team of coaches that you you like you know like this coach is really good in the technical area I can learn stuff from him or her um, this coach is great at the uh, at the creative game piece and you know purposeful games so I'm going to learn from them so um, there's lots of different ways I think to uh, be a better coach than just looking at yeah I like the way Eddie Jones coaches I'm going to be like him there's no chance I'm not going to be that guy. So, but he does some things which I like and I'll steal from him. So, yeah. I have six. Um, they're mostly, mostly in the community, quite honestly. Uh, so I'll, I'll rattle off some names. Um, in Alberta, Graham Moffat, I think is one of the best coaches I've worked with uh, in his ability to um, plan for the weakness of the other team. So he'll watch a team play. And then he's really good at planning some stuff that's going to make it really hard for that team to play that way. So I think he sees the game in a different way to me. Uh, and it's a skill that I, I think I need to work on. So uh, he's one for me. Uh, Sandra Fiorino, Ontario. Uh, I think his overall perspective on program planning and just his experience, I think he asks really deep question, reflective questions. So when I send something to him, I know I'm going to get an answer and I'm not going to have to think about it a little bit more. Um, so he's right in your backyard. I think he's outstanding. Uh, one in my backyard here in BC, Christian Esterhazen is probably uh, strategically uh, one of the best coaches and, and building a culture and a program. Um, so he's currently the head coach of the Vancouver Wave and I work underneath him as an assistant coach. Uh, he just sees things five minutes before everybody else sees them. Um, so where, when I think the best option is to kick for goal and, and he thinks the best option is to kick uh, for the touchline, 99% of the time he's right and I'm wrong. Um, and so I'm, I'm really learning about that from him. Uh, there's a, a guy that was in BC, uh, is now back in England. Phil Llewellyn is one of the best uh, questioners best at asking questions that, that I've noticed. Uh, he's got a really cool podcast that you can connect with as well. Uh, Rugby Coaching Weekly podcast. Um, unbelievable questions, really deep thinker. 
Um, Russell Inshaw, probably the most creative and energetic. Um, he has... So he's the king of connection. So he knows everybody and he can connect a lot of people. And I think that's what our sport is about, is about connecting and learning from lots of different people. And then finally, my only international coach that um, I really, really look up to is Scott Wisemantle, who is currently the attack coach at Australia. Uh, I've been really fortunate enough to spend um, some time with him. Um, he is probably one of those informal conversations where a lot of those um, small sided games came from. Um, so I think he thinks about the game differently. You can tell which team he's coaching by the way that team plays. Uh, and often, you know, they're the most creative in, in what they're trying to do. So that's my list. Connect with them. Sandro is in your backyard. Um, yeah, I got a lot of time for him. Yeah, lots of great names. I'm sure people will be uh, emailing or Googling or uh, yeah. Um, I, I wonder if either of you want to talk about sort of your your values in coaching and how that shapes what you do and how you do it. No, that's a big question I didn't prep you for. <laughs> um, it's something that I'm working through actually at the moment. Um, so go back to the book that I referenced, um, The Culture System. Um, values is somewhere where you, you kind of, you start. Um, and so what I've done with that, I think values change. Um, your personal values don't change, but often you're working with a group. So therefore you have to think as a group and have to find some common, common ground where your, your values intersect. So I think it, it's, it's a process that we have to go, off, go through often if you change the group in which you're coaching with. Um, so it's something that we haven't done well so far, I think with, with my school group. Um, so it's something that we are going through this process with by using this really great book. Um, I think ultimately it comes down to being good people, um, wanting feedback and, and to, to challenge and learn and, and develop would be the fundamental basis of it. Um, I don't know if I could give you ex an explicit response to that question because I think they change all the time. Um, like I said, on the, on the context of what do the players want? And my values are going to change based on that as well. Yeah, I think for me, it goes, I mean, yeah, over time, my values have changed. Um, but I think on a specific point um, this year at uh, Brock, we did co-create a code of conduct for the team. The university has one for all their student athletes. But uh, we wanted a specific one for us, the rugby team. And um, so we sat down and created this code of conduct on what behaviors would be acceptable. Um, how do we want to be seen as Brock women's rugby um, on those kind of things? And if this happened, what are the consequences? So um, it didn't happen overnight by any stretch. It, was, it happened over time. And when we finally came up with this document, um, the uh, our sports administration liked it so much that they started going to other teams and said you know maybe you want to use something like this or come up with something like this um so i think the the powerful thing was the fact that it was really them that came up with it and the coaching staff just facilitated um and uh now they live by it and they do call each other out now and again when things happen or they'll come to me and say this person isn't living up to the standards um, that we set out, you know, uh, could you have a conversation with them? And it's like, sure, because it might might have been something that I wasn't aware of at that time. Thanks, guys. Um, so we had yeah a question here to kind of come back to a few few of Aaron's slides, maybe. I know there was a lot of information in some of these, so. Um, and I don't know if you want to kind of pick a few that you think you could um, pull a few more pieces out of, or if anyone has any specific questions, any, anything that they, they uh, would like a little bit more information on, feel free to throw that into the chat now as well, the Q&A, sorry. I think this is the one that I would go to first. Um, just some of the elements within it. So uh, we talked about fun. Uh, fun is often a game. It doesn't have to be a rugby game, but often I'll start a session with a game. Um, so you'll see there's, there's start with a game, start with a game. Um, and the other thing that 
um, that is a, an element within this is adding pressure. So sometimes we don't, don't um, recreate moments of the, the game in our training session. So uh, one chance rugby might be, you have one chance to throw a line out to the back. Um, you have one chance to kick this penalty to touch. Um, so it's adding pressure of that environment and, and with lots of other players around in that moment. So often those kind of isolated skills are really great to, to make sure that you recreate those throughout the week. Um, sometimes we'll end up with a, a competition so rather than just a one person recreating that moment, we'll maybe have uh, two goal kickers kicking at post for, for a competition or two hookers throwing. Um, it might be any kind of competition that you can think of um, at the end of those sessions as well. And then there's some academic stuff in there as well. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be able to use GPS within, um, within the school, but um, really managing things like uh, total running distance um, but you'll notice in here that there are really low impact or non-physical days as well. Um, whereas the physical days might have a com combat emphasis. So making sure um, that contact is managed throughout the week and the load is managed throughout the week. Um, so on this day, it's really about more running capacity, whereas this day is more about accelerations and, and changing, it, changing direction. Um, and then on match day, it's about players leading. Um, so making sure that there's clarity and things like that. And then an active recovery day, there might be some light movement and maybe talking about a slightly different kick strategy, which can be involved in just kind of a jog through. But again, it's gonna start with the game and focus on skills. So I think this way is, it, it adds consistency, although the content within it might change week to week. It gives us a really easy template to go, okay, this is what it is. And the players then learn to expect Okay, on, on Monday, we're, we're going to put some capacity running in and we're going to develop some endurance. Um, and, and on a Wednesday, we're going to try and move as fast as possible and, and have some competition in there. So that's the one that I would revisit. And again, that's based on uh, a lot of the tactical periodization stuff written by um, TL 2018. So hopefully that gave you a bit more perspective there, Stu, if there's, uh, yeah, again, anyone else who wants uh, anything else? Um, Aaron, I know you mentioned you have to go pick up some kids uh, shortly. So if you have any last minute questions for Aaron, now is the time. Otherwise, we will uh, get into maybe some rapid fire with Smurdy. You get to, you get to represent all the panelists today, Smurdy. And I, I put it in the chat already. I'll happily share all the sh slides and videos. Um, Justin, they'll come to you and then you can maybe forward them all to, the, to everybody that attended. Yeah, we'll make sure everything gets out. And if you have questions that come up afterwards, uh, feel free to, to send them over as well. Um, we'll try not to bug you guys too much, but I'm, I'm sure you're happy to answer a few. Okay. All right, well, thank Double you so eight. much, Aaron. I know you got to run. And Smurdy, now, if you still have questions for Mark, um, again, throw them up in the Q&A, but we'll get into a few kind of rapid fire pieces and see what else we can learn about you. Um, so uh, Smurdy, why do you love rugby and or coaching? Oh, you're on mute still. Mark, Smurdy, you're on mute still. Thank you. Um, yeah, I started playing rugby as a schoolboy in England. Um, I was not the best soccer player. I wasn't the most fit, but, you know, rugby is one of those that was uh, anybody can play pretty much. And as I got into it, as we we know as coaches, uh, we find the athletes from other sports and introduce rugby to them. Uh, a lot of them just fall in love with the game because there's just so much to it. They get to do so many different things, unlike football, where you might run down and catch a ball all the time um you know the quarterback's probably the only one that has as much fun as they do um, um so you know I, I really got that passion for rugby through those kind of things and uh you know as you do get better at it as you get fitter you're able to do more things and enjoy the game more so so that was kind of where my enjoyment came from I guess um coaching uh I mean I I was coaching different sports before I uh, became a teacher. So 
I, I liked coaching. I liked um, sort of the fact that I got those rewards watching or teaching and then seeing athletes perform what you taught and got get better and enjoy with the smiles on their face and those kind of things. And then I got into education and uh, being a teacher, even though not phys ed, I was a math teacher, but um, I think things that I learned from coaching, I took into the math classroom, things from the math classroom I took into coaching, um, the way I taught, not the numbers, obviously. Um, but uh, I just had that passion um, for seeing people develop, seeing athletes develop and get better and have that enjoyment and then watching them progress beyond where I took them type thing. Um, so either as people or as rugby players. So um, so I hopefully that answered that quick question. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, what is something you've learned recently or that you're excited to learn more about? Uh, well, I think one of the things, again, we I, I alluded to it with the leadership groups in our, our Brock team. Um, every single player has a role. They're in a group. Um, it might be something to do with leadership. It might be something to do with rugby. It might be something to do with um, getting involved with the community, getting the team involved with the community somehow, um, those type of things. We have a, um, a rookie mentorship group. So they're the ones that kind of look after what do we do to sort of bring these rookies into or first years um, into our our team into our family and uh, how do we help them go from living at home to living in university and uh, you know a big transition of their lives so um, it's kind of neat that all these different groups everyone has a role as a leader and everyone is doing something to create our culture or improve on our culture uh, and I think that's really really helps um, um, well, it's helped our culture for sure. Everyone's involved with something. And I think they're engaged because of that. And they feel they're they're adding value as well. So, yeah. So that's something that we're going to be reflecting on constantly and um, we'll be improving on. <clears throat> um, what is your biggest uh, piece of advice or take home message for all the coaches listening? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um Again, I think I might have alluded to it previously, and that's you've got to coach um, within your wheelhouse, um, within your personality. Don't try to be something you're not. Um, that was something I was told actually by my dad before I started teaching. Um, you know, when you go into that classroom, don't try and fake it until you make it. I know that's the famous saying, but uh, it doesn't work. So you've got to kind of be yourself and learn how to be yourself in that that classroom, that classroom management or out on the field, uh, uh, you know, managing your, your team kind of thing. So uh, it's probably my, my biggest piece of advice, which I stole from my dad. So <laughs> not a bad place to steal some advice, right? <laughs> um, and our last piece is uh, if anyone is looking for more info on any of these topics, um, are there other, other resources or anything else you would recommend in terms of where people could maybe find some more info. Um, a few pieces throughout the night, I think. Hopefully people have Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of what we've talked about tonight, quite honestly, uh, I'm also a um, learning facilitator, so coaching the coaches courses. Um, a lot of what we have discussed are in those courses, whether it's level one or more in depth, uh, level two type stuff. Um, so if you haven't done those yet, they're, they're valuable courses. Um, I enjoy teaching them. Um, and, you know, just like I enjoy coaching. Um, and it's, you know, it's not us telling someone else how to coach. It's just making them aware of what's there, how to use things, how to question, how to session plan, all those things that we have kind of really discussed tonight. So, um, so yeah, if you haven't taken those courses or you've done the level one and haven't done level two yet, uh, it's another good course. Um, and, you know, those kind of things are are good uh, for for moving up and learning. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Um, last, last call, if anyone has any questions. 
Going once, going mm -hmm. twice. Okay. I'll turn over to you. Well, thank you, Mark. And um, what is it? Thank You're you, Aaron. Well, thank you for taking the time to, for, uh, to share your knowledge and experiences with us tonight. Uh, you shared some valuable insights and tips that our coaches can take away. And uh, thank you to everyone for coming. We hope you enjoyed this session. Uh, a reminder that our next session is next Monday um, from 7 to 8.30, and it is competition, attack structure, and tactics. Um, so if you're interested in that one, we hope to see you all there. Otherwise, that's all we have for tonight. So have a great rest of your night. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.